I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute, where we help leaders be future ready. Helping us in that mission today is Matthew Griffin, a world-class futurist and the founder and CEO of 311 Institute, a global futures and deep futures advisory, and the World Futures Forum and Exponential University, two philanthropic organizations whose mission is to reduce global inequity. So Matthew is busy. Thank you for joining us. We're delighted that you're here. Hey, you're most welcome. And Dopsy Pie here, we mean in separate places. So I'm glad to be at home. <laughs> and I'm glad to be at home too having a conversation with you where I can see you. Yeah, that's it. Once in a while, I have been known to actually go home. Which I assume your family is happy about. Mm, less so. If not, you don't need to share that in public. So we were talking in the pre-conversation about specifically with all of your work with futures, that you have thousands of pages of research doing this, working in the boardroom, C-suites, across the world, what should leaders be thinking about at this point in time? A lot, I suppose, basically, is really the very high level answer. And we could just leave it there. But if we dig into it, you know, when we have a look at where the world is today, there is just so much going on. So if we sort of start from a really high level, when we have a look at the vast majority of leaders, basically, within the boardroom, Firstly, they're dealing with a huge amount of uncertainty. That's a given. We've seen that really over the past decade and more. That's not going away. And actually, that's not only just increasing, but actually it's accelerating that level of uncertainty. But some of the stats that I've seen is when you have conversations with, say, companies like McKinsey, increasingly, some of the stats that stand out to me is that 55% of what happens to an organization now is not under the direct control of the CEO. Now, that means that the CEO, the captain of the ship, is no longer actually in charge of really steering that ship, is not the majority, should we say, shareholder or stakeholder steering that ship's course. In addition to that, when we have a look at some of the PwC research that we've seen, 40% of the CEOs that they've surveyed around the world, and they surveyed about 4,500 of them, said that in 10 years' time, they do not expect their businesses to be viable, economically viable. So just when you have a look at those top two stats alone, 55% of what happens to a company is not controlled by the CEO or directed by the CEO or influenced particularly by the CEO. And 40% of CEOs believe that their businesses will essentially, I mean, realistically, if you swap out the words economically unviable for going bust, that's the undiplomatic term, let's face it. Those are just two crazy stats right off the bat. And now you kind of bring in all the other things basically that CEOs are having to think about and essentially worry about. And I'm surprised a lot of them actually aren't seeing counselors and traumatized for life, which actually ironically brings me to another little stat because I do tend to like my stats is when we have a look at the CEO position, if we sort of zero in on the CEO, because, you know, we like that. About 20 years ago, the average CEO tenure was about 10 years. But now the average CEO tenure is really five to six years. So when we talk about what leaders are actually having to put up with, increasingly, we could actually argue that as the world gets more uncertain, as it gets more complex, as we look towards a multipolar world, a bipolar world, a world that is splitting along so many different lines, it's crazy. CEOs, are they actually really coping? Yeah, because if the tenure has halved, then are they genuinely coping? And when you have a look at the stats, maybe not. I say this only partially in jest as we look at trends like the psilocybin usage mm. and other mechanisms that would have been not conceivable a decade ago, at least not publicly shared. Yeah. Now we've got CEOs sitting around doing group psilocybin exercises. Yeah. It seems like we are more open to considering alternate methods of coping, which to me is a sign that CEOs and senior executives are looking for ways to manage the challenges that they didn't need to do before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you have a look at really what's crossing a CEO's desk, you know, if you have a look at Steep, for example, and it's not just the CEO, it's the rest of the leadership team as well, obviously. 
if we're slightly mean to them, we talk to them as, as a pack. From a societal perspective, we have a huge number of new societal behaviours that are coming through, whether it's polarised society, whether it's distrust and disinformation, whether it's activism and new forms of activism and protests and so on and so forth, whether it's new buying behaviours. You know, we see the rise of purpose-led consumerism. We see the rise, basically, of ethical capitalism as well, as opposed to just capitalism. When we have a look at things like technological disruption, I mean, where do you want to start with that one? You know, we had Web3, then we had the metaverse, we had blockchain, now we've got AI, we've got 5G and 6G coming through. From a tech disruption perspective, that's a crazy space, which I think we'll probably dive into in a bit. When we have a look at the environment, basically, you know, we are now seeing more multi-billion dollar disasters than ever before. The general conversations that I have with the US government suggest that over the next 10 years, we need to be investing around $32 trillion in resilient infrastructure to protect our cities. When we have a look at global sea level rise up towards 2050, almost every major mega city on the planet is going to be partially underwater, which leads to up to a billion people being displaced, which then puts more pressure on society as we see economic and environmental migration increasing. When we actually have a look at things like economics, are we in a recession? Aren't we in a recession, et cetera? You know, we've got historically high inflation and interest rates. I was in Ghana the other day, by seeing the interest rates there are running at 64% and the economy seems to be on the verge of collapse. We've had a couple of Asian countries that have actually filed for bankruptcy. When we have a look at the amount of disposable income in, say, for example, Americans' pockets, it's at the lowest levels ever. The rate of public debt when we have a look at government debt, it's gone up by about 40% since COVID. So we have historically high public debt levels. That's got to be paid back, which means that we are generally going to see an increase in the amount of indirect taxation, which is really on goods and services. We're not even touching the surface with some of these challenges. But I mean, politics, you know, we're moving to that bipolar world, multipolar world. We've got the bricks separating out. So we're starting to see the separation of different parts of the world along cultural, economic and political lines. And when we just have a look at the political situation, we've got this kind of this versus them. We've got fragile government. You know, when we have a look at the US, the only thing that most US politicians can agree on is they don't agree on anything, which is great. At least we've got a starting point, you know. And again, from a corporate perspective, when you have this level of, should we say, political fragility, when we get one administration in and they set regulations and policies and laws that look like this, and then the next administration comes in and reverses it all, you've got a huge amount of regulatory uncertainty. If you're in the boardroom, frankly, it doesn't really matter where you look today, you want to bury your head in the sand. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of the challenge. Stay insane. With this level of uncertainty, what's the old proverb about where there's chaos, there's also opportunity. Indeed. Somebody wins when there is this level of chaos. How do we help conscious leaders who are able to surf this level of chaos move their organizations and the humans that work for them to a stable place? You say stable. So when I'm talking to, I say leaders, but you know, when I'm talking to stakeholders and people, I say that we're kind of in this very strange world of business where at a very high level, your business needs to be able to do two things. On the one hand, it needs to be resilient. So it needs to be able to be resilient to new shocks, for example. But on the other side of the fence, it also needs to be highly flexible and adaptable because as we start seeing rapid changes in things, whether it's policies, customer behaviors, the competitive marketplace, you need to be able to move at speed. So really, we kind of have this very odd situation going on where businesses on the one hand need to be resilient. Think supply chains, think hiring and staffing, talent retention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Think about delivering shareholder value, but they need to be highly adaptable. And actually, those two don't really go together. Resilience typically locks us into a single set of standards and processes, a particular way of doing things repeatedly, that kind of scalable efficiency that all companies look for. Whereas adaptability 
is much more of a modular style organization that is able to spot something new, like your pet dogs. They spot something new and suddenly they're racing after it. It's like, hang on, you know, you've got this. What is he doing? You've got to have these almost modular organizations that are able to spot new things and then go off and chase that new shiny thing because that new shiny thing could be a big new market opportunity. And balancing that is very, very difficult. It's not necessarily impossible, but most traditional organizations and legacy organizations just simply weren't built that way. They were built for that scalable efficiency, which is, this is what we sell. These are the markets that we sell them into, and this is how we do it. You know, and that's the the process alignment, the people alignment, the mission alignment, et cetera, et cetera. And it all stacks up nicely. So Yeah, I continually feel for leaders. What about the term liberating structure? So when I think about how we operate, and we're much smaller, so either I can say we're doing a great job of this or I'm delusional, but there is some amount of structure that we have in place and we can pivot from it, but we need some amount of structure. People need to know what they do. They need to know what the responsibilities are. They need to know the cadence. We may then opt to say this week, we're going to shift that, but at least we know what we're shifting shifting from and to. We have a vision. We may choose to deviate, but there's a conscious choice that's shared among the team so we can realign. In theory, we don't look like the Three Stooges. This is where you need some anchoring principles. And really, the anchoring principle for most organizations is their vision, mission, and purpose. So, for example, you know, if your company has a particular purpose, the way that you deliver that purpose, the products that you build, et cetera, et cetera, the way that you sell all those products might change. But overall, basically, that purpose is your North Star, your Polaris, and you are still overall headed in the same direction, albeit you're changing the aircraft in mid-flight as you actually head towards that North Star. So there absolutely have to be some anchoring, I say principles, but also basically from a mental health perspective, globally, one in six people, adults, now suffer from some form of mental health issue to different sort of severities and everything else. When we have a look at, for example, things like job automation, increasingly that's driving this sort of fear of the future. So from an organizational perspective, we've got that anchoring North Star, the purpose, et cetera, et cetera. But our culture is also an anchor as well. Because if people trust the organization, if the people in the organization trust that the organization has their own interests at heart from an individual perspective, then that is also an anchoring feeling. And then again, you start changing the aircraft around you. But if you don't have the right culture, if you don't know what your purpose is, and if you don't have trust within the organization, while everything else around you is this kind of swirling vortex, basically of chaos and uncertainty, then it's going to be much, much easier for your organization to be torn apart, not only from the outside, but also from the inside. What I'm then calling liberating structures, purpose, North Star, vision, whatever words you use for it, because I know we bicker about what's a mission and what's a vision, but that kind of who we are, the culture of how do we treat each other. Yeah. Even on a bad day, we have a certain sense of how we interact with one another. Yeah. Fundamentally, as organizations, if we leaders don't have our people's backs, if we aren't trustworthy, you know, if we aren't to play kitsch, if we aren't leading by example, then we don't actually deserve to be in the seats that we're actually in in the first place. When we have a look at a lot of the employees within organizations, during these especially uncertain times, people within these companies are actually looking to leaders to be that voice of reason, that voice of guidance, that stability, because that's what we expect, basically, from leaders. You know, we expect somewhat unfairly leaders to have all of the answers. We expect leaders basically to always be cool, calm and collected. It's that sort of swan analogy, you know, leaders on the surface of the water, you know, need to look like that graceful swan. You know, we know everything, everything's under control, nothing can phase us. But meanwhile, underneath the water, you're kicking your legs like crazy trying to stay afloat. So From a leadership perspective, we almost have this sort of responsibility to provide our organization with this illusion. But actually, we also need the substance to be able to back up that illusion. 
And that's the tricky bit. As you say that, one of the things that comes to mind is we, especially post-COVID, have talked a lot about authenticity. And when I'm having a panic attack, I don't want people around me who think I need to seem stable to think I'm having a panic attack. Because if my level of calmness allows the team to stay calm and function, if I look like I'm ready to go jump out a window it will appropriately cause my team concern. Absolutely. It's this, you know, when we have a look at things like uncertainty and fear and anxiety and all these sort of other acronyms that we don't actually like, they can spread a little bit like a disease, but also, you know, the ripple effects are crazy. You know, if the leaders at the top outwardly look anxious, look worried, don't look like they're in control, don't look like they know what they're doing, it infects the rest of the organisation. And then all of a sudden, the entire organization is, are we really doing the right thing? Is this really the market that we should be going after? Is this really what we should be doing? And as soon as an organization lets doubt creep in, shall we say, to the mission, to the culture, to whatever we want to say, it's the disease that eats the organization from within. Because all of a sudden, if people think that the leader's are worrying, the leaders are anxious, then I start getting anxiety. And as an employee, if I'm anxious about the organization that I'm working for, do I now start looking for another job? And if I go and have a look for another job, are my teammates now having a look for another job? And then do we end up with the lemming exodus where suddenly everyone's leaving what was a perfectly fine business with great foundations to go somewhere else? And now that business is the effective leaning tower of Pisa where The foundations are going and it's just starting to fall over. So leaders, as some of them tell me, they have what they feel is some of the loneliest jobs because they can be feeling all of these things that all of us other humans are feeling, anxiety, worry for the future and all this sort of stuff. But the vast majority of them don't really feel enabled or empowered to actually show any of this because of the impact it will have on share prices in front of AGMs and on the public news broadcasts, in front of their staff at the town halls and so on and so forth. This is why certainly one of the things I've seen, quite a lot more leaders are actually going off for retreats where they're actually going to retreats to have conversations with other leaders like them. And increasingly, a lot of the conversations, for example, if we have a look at Aspen and even Davos, there are more leaders who are saying, look, outwardly, I look fine. But inwardly, I'm struggling because I don't know what to do here. I've never seen the market act like that before. I don't know what's happening over here. And stuff's just starting to get on top of me. And actually, when we have a look at the boardroom, mental health is one of the probably greatest unspoken, I was going to say cancers, but that's a bit of a mean word in the boardroom. And if our leaders basically aren't actually feeling well in themselves, I mean, some of my clients, for example, have got anywhere between 300 to 700,000 people. I mean, there's one that's got 1.2 million people employed. If the leaders aren't looking strong, if they don't seem on top of things, not necessarily the word, but if they don't seem on top of things, the ripple effects through the organizations can be poor, let alone titanic. Let's go back to something you said earlier, and now I want to kind of hit a juxtaposition of two things, but you started with 55% of CEOs think they don't control, what was the stat, the 55%? 55% of what happens to a business isn't directly controlled by the CEO. So things like a net zero policy that's, should we say, not necessarily enforced, but net zero policies, zero waste policies, ESG and investment, climate change, political, should we say, traumas, uh, lightly, and so on and so forth. Those are exogenous factors that, yes, as a CEO, if I run an insurance company, I'm kind of at the mercy of the climate. When we have a look, for example, at Louisiana and uh, Florida in the United States, the vast majority of insurers are pulling out of both of those states, not because they don't have customers, but because they simply can no longer put up basically with the premiums or the expenditures in those states because of climate change. When we actually have a look, for example, at an insurance CEO, take, for example, State Farm, which I think is one of the very few insurers left in Florida, most of their competitors have actually moved out of Florida because you end up with hurricanes rolling through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as a consequence, 
Florida and Louisiana increasingly become unprofitable for insurance companies to be in. So they leave. So when we have a look at all of these external factors, I mean, I cover 250 megatrends across different lines of business and sectors and the steep spectrum, shall we say. There are so many things that can sideswipe a business, not really a leadership team by association. There are so many things that can actually sideswipe a business now that would never have originally been on the table, that it's quite insane. I assume that's part of what contributes to the mental health issues. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, if you have a look at, say, pre-COVID, the markets were generally ticking up in the right direction. But if you'd said pre-COVID, by the way, at least half the planet basically will be shut down by this virus, you'd be laughed out of town. But that happened. Businesses had to spin on a dime. On Friday, we were operating normally. On Monday, all of our physical stores were shut, for example. All of our bank branches were shut. We weren't able to bring people into the office, you know, so we had that kind of thing. When we come out of COVID, we have incredibly high inflation, basically, which not only energy, but also materials. We had supply chain snarl-ups. Then we actually had war. Now we've not got one war, we've got two wars. In addition to that, we had huge trade tensions. We had tariffs, basically, on all kinds of different things. We saw corporations going on to American corporate blacklists that we'd never thought of before. I mean, if you have a look at NVIDIA now, for example, NVIDIA is increasingly being banned from selling chips to China. If you were the CEO of NVIDIA, where was that in your business plan? And so now when we have a look, for example, at NVIDIA, we've now got tensions in the South China Sea, which means that we now see strategic dislocation from a global perspective. So originally, NVIDIA, if we take them as a bit of an example, one of the biggest risks that NVIDIA highlighted to the SEC recently was that all of their chip manufacturing is out of Taiwan. And as we see tensions over in that region increase, suddenly that's a material impact to NVIDIA. So now, basically, we've got companies like TSMC, the semiconductor company, now actually opening plants up in America as we start seeing techno-nationalism and techno-protectionism actually on the rise. Again, you know, if you went to the CEO of NVIDIA and said, by the way, we think in a few years' time, you'll be looking to invest tens of billions of dollars in chip fabrication in the United States, it'd be like, well, no, it's not in our business plan. But then sticking with the semiconductor industry, because of the corporate blacklisting that we saw with the Trump administration, we've seen China investing $1.4 trillion in developing emerging technologies. We've seen Europe suddenly realize basically that because of the political tensions, they can't necessarily rely on the allies that they thought that they could. So now we're seeing Europe starting to try to build its own chip industry up as well. So just from a chip and a semiconductor perspective, Volkswagen, the car company, is now starting to make its own chipsets. And if you went to Volkswagen and said, you know, we think in a couple of years' time, you'll be a chip designer and a chip manufacturer, they'd go, no. And that's just looking at, say, semiconductors, basically, within the backdrop of geopolitical tensions. When we have a look, for example, at India, huge amounts of climate change basically actually means that a lot of the rice fields in India have flooded. So India is restricting exports of rice. That affects hundreds of millions of people. When we have a look at trade tensions as well, we see this concept called of resource scarcity cropping up all the time. And I see it at government level all the time, where we see the export ban of rare earth metals. So suddenly companies that are manufacturing the semiconductors like NVIDIA in the US, all of a sudden they're saying, well, we can't get hold of gallium any longer, or it's a problem. Where do we get that from? When we have a look at the world today, to one degree, it looks like we're just staring at a domino pack. And someone flicked the first domino kind of like in 2019. And all of a sudden, the whole lot's going. And try as you might to get ahead of it, no one's been able to get ahead of it, which then means that, you know, we're looking to leaders going, by the way, you know, as a society and as your employees and as your shareholders, we can see all of these dominoes going down. What's your plan? And the leaders are expected to turn around and say, so I've looked at everything and being the fount of all knowledge, here is my perfect plan. There you go. You're welcome. And 
the truth of the matter is the vast majority of leadership teams that I'm speaking to, they are, to a degree, without really going down this rabbit hole too much, they're scrambling to try to figure out what next and then what else is coming next. What are the new black swans? What are the things that we haven't thought of? As a futurist, we kind of talk about the future in terms of preferred futures, probable futures, preposterous futures, et cetera, et cetera. Increasingly, it's the preposterous futures that are actually becoming our actual modern day life, which is just ironic. Where we are right now, what one or two black swans or preposterous futures are in the five-year or 10-year window that our listeners should be at least contemplated? So (laughs) there's a few. Top of my head. So on the one hand, while a lot of leaders are actually paying attention to what is China doing, I mean, I must admit, I do get slightly sick of the China conversation because it's always what's America doing and what's China doing? And it's like, well, there are another, what, 180 plus countries on the planet. Some of them are doing some other things. So while a lot of leaders are focused on what is China doing, I think a better question we'll be asking is what are the BRICs doing? So when we actually have a look at, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and so on and so forth, because when we have a look at the BRICs, increasingly the BRICs are getting new members. So we're seeing new members from Africa entering the BRICs. We're also seeing possibly Saudi Arabia entering the BRICs. Now, the BRICs as a block, not really a trading block, but the BRICs as a block represent about 45% of global trade and about 50% of all the people on the planet. So it's a significant block. But when we actually have a look at what the BRICs are up to, Increasingly, the BRICS are trying to develop their own digital currencies to undermine the US dollar. So I know Ray DeLalio has talked about this. Lots of US investors are talking about the de-dollarization of the world. Now, when you start de-dollarizing the world, that has a huge economic impact basically on both society, but also businesses and investments and so on and so forth. So I think leaders should, on the one hand, expand their point of view away from just China to what are the BRICS up to. Because when we have a look out towards 2050, it's estimated that global GDP will double, but that 80 plus percent of that GDP will come from 32 different countries, which isn't very many when you have a look at the number of countries on the planet. So that's one thing. When you have a look at the way that the world is currently splitting, which sounds like a really bad term, but actually it's really an evolution as we move from a world basically where we had one kingpin to you know, multiple kingpins. So on the one hand, leaders should be thinking less about just China and thinking China and the BRICS. When we have a look at this transition period that we're in, moving from a homogenous world basically to a multipolar, bipolar world, increasingly we are seeing the world splitting across particular lines. So we are seeing an economic split. We're seeing a political split where, for example, it's increasingly democracy and. So we're seeing the aggregation of authoritarian states. So we have this political split. And then we also have a cultural split. So with some of the organizations that I work for, they're seen as very Western brands. And you can kind of probably guess who they are. I do also actually work extensively basically throughout Asia, including basically with the Chinese government and other Chinese organizations. So I'm relatively unique in that I actually see what's happening inside all of these different countries at every level, which is freaky in some respects, but it's also very advantageous. Now, when we actually have a look at the Asian markets, for example, increasingly being seen as a Western brand is not necessarily the narrative that you want to take. Because increasingly, with a variety of different countries, if you're seen as a Western brand, then you're actually pushed down the priority list. So from a leadership perspective, are you a Western brand or an Eastern brand? It works both ways, you know. I don't really like getting into this West versus the rest or developed nations versus undeveloped nations or developing nations and so forth and so forth. I don't think it's particularly productive. But are you a, for example, Western brand or are you a global brand? Because in the markets that you are entering into, if you're seen as a global brand whose purpose, for example, is to help people prosper, then you're going to be more readily accepted than being seen as a Western brand that is perhaps trying to push Western values and Western cultures 
onto countries and populations that might be resistant to that, for example. And then when we talk about splits, we're seeing a technological split as well. So we see, for example, with the Chinese programs, where, as I mentioned earlier, I met the vice minister of the Ministry of Science and Technology in Hong Kong a number of months ago. He's got a $1.4 trillion emerging technology budget to last him five years. That's double the European and American budgets combined for technology. And increasingly, China basically are trying to dominate global technology standards. So you have a 5G standard that is Chinese. You have Chinese AI, Chinese high voltage energy systems, Chinese quantum technologies, these kinds of things. So when I say the world is splitting, personally, I think leaders need to pay more attention to what is splitting and where we are in that split, because it's cultural, it's economic, it's political, and it's technological splits. And that affects how you see and perceive markets, how you evaluate markets, but also how you create products and sell into those markets, and then how you stand up distribution and everything else in those markets. And then when we have a look at other things, we've got a huge amount of artificial intelligence, technological-led disruption. So you know, when we have a look at that, that's a whole conversation in itself. Because if we just have a look at generative AI, the vast majority of listeners will see generative artificial intelligence as chat GPT, Bard, Alibaba's Bernie, if we're including a global audience. I've been talking about generative artificial intelligence for a decade. I used to call them creative machines because they didn't have a tagline. But when we have a look at generative artificial intelligence, it's much more than an AI that can put together good text or turn data within an organization into knowledge and wisdom for itself, not for humans. You know, we used to talk about AI being able to analyze information within a company to identify patterns, and then leaders being able to identify those patterns and then try to make sense of them to turn those into insights and knowledge. But as artificial intelligence becomes increasingly adept at understanding human language and all the context that goes along with it, increasingly from companies like DeepMind and Google, as well as OpenAI, we're seeing the development of artificial intelligences that can ingest information in flat form and then turn it into their own knowledge. So we saw this with DeepMind about two years ago, where it took in information about chess games and that sort of stuff and created its own knowledge. So when we talk about thinking machines, increasingly we have AIs that not only generate their own knowledge from data, but if you generate knowledge from something, the next step is to turn it into wisdom. So we are starting to get closer to an age of intelligent machines, because at the moment, AI is really just this probabilistic sort of, if this happens, then that engine. But we're now starting to get to AIs that are genuinely smart. However, you know, when we actually have a look at say, 2028 to 2030, according to the CEO of DeepMind, as well as to Sam Altman, we are edging closer towards artificial general intelligence. Now, AGI is the kind of technology that genuinely rivals human thinking yeah, and human skills and human cognitive capabilities. And just to put this into context, ChatGPT, eight months ago, had a verbal IQ of 155. It contains more than a thousand times more general knowledge than any human mind, not specialist knowledge, but general knowledge. And it learns 300 million times faster than any human. As we look towards 2028, with artificial general intelligence, we are looking, we believe, at AIs that have an IQ of 1600, which I had to look up because I thought that was impossible with a billion times more knowledge than any human. And those AIs, a little bit like what we see with ChatGPT and GPT-4 today and GPT-5 when it comes, increasingly have the ability to tap into multi-domain and cross-domain knowledge to not only benefit workers, but also to benefit organizations. You know, one of my clients is Ernst & Young, and recently they spent $1.6 billion developing an artificial intelligence for their own internal use called ey.ai. 
And that particular AI turns Ernst & Young, which is already seen to be a knowledge organization, into a knowledge organization on steroids, where an individual tax advisor within Ernst & Young, if they're working on, for example, a mergers and acquisitions transaction, and they're looking at it from a tax perspective, all of a sudden, this person who is a T-shaped individual, a tax expert, can have a conversation with a machine and say, so if the European Union came up with a new green energy policy, which looked a bit like this, what would be the impact of that on my customer's tax or valuation or mergers and acquisitions transactions or whatever it happens to be? So rather than having to ask a policy expert in EY, suddenly this tax advisor can ask the artificial intelligence and get access to the data and the insights that that policy advisor would have had. So increasingly as a society, we move from being T-shaped individuals to what I call very stupidly, whatever, W-shaped individuals, where increasingly as we automate different parts of the tech stack, as we automate different jobs and skills and tasks, all of a sudden we are giving other people who don't have those skills or that expertise access to those skills and expertise. So we're democratizing access to skill. We are democratizing access to expertise. And when we have a look at these generative artificial intelligences, they're helping companies like Toyota design EV batteries in two weeks. That would have taken two years. Under Armour designed a sneaker in two hours that normally would take them 18 months. We've got General Motors using these AIs to develop new cars faster. We've got Google using these AIs to develop new chips, AI chips, faster. We're talking like hours. We've got DeepMind that can design new novel proteins basically in minutes and new vaccines in minutes. So when leaders actually look at the whole topic of artificial intelligence, they will obviously zero in on what's ChatGPT doing today. But actually, if you only look at, say, ChatGPT or these AIs from the point of view of a, so it generates text now, so what? then you are missing the giant iceberg beneath the surface. So AI at a high to medium level is a lot more disruptive to everything that your business cares about than you think. But it's both disruptive as a threat. It's also disruptive as an opportunity because every threat is also an opportunity if you can understand it and if you can then figure out so what and how do we turn this to our advantage. As you say that, one of the things that strikes me is going back to your tax advisor example. Now we have a whole cadre of people who haven't developed special skills for various reasons, including they couldn't economically afford to go to college or whatever. I may not need a physician to do all the things a physician used to do. I may be able to work with someone who AI co-pilot can help me diagnose things. And then my physician visit is absolutely the specialist where I need the specialist. They actually have to touch my body. We talked about chiropractors. I still don't have a robot poking Thank God. yet, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do have a robot dentist. <laughs> But no, I mean, you're absolutely right. So when we actually have a look at the fundamental conversation about the future of work, the statistics that the news organizations and consultancies push out generally go along these lines. By 2030, artificial intelligence will be able to partially and or fully automate up to 80% of jobs, okay? And there's always been this general belief that if you're someone with a college education, if you don't have a PhD and a master's, then the artificial intelligence wagon is going to roll straight over you, crush your income and crush all your dreams. You know, it's the real dystopian future. It's the terminator of dreams. However, we're actually finding the exact opposite. I'll dig into that one a little bit if I can. There's a lot of different examples I can actually use. But one of my favorites basically is this. Now, say, for example, you have just been employed as a consultant for KPMG. Now, we know that KPMG is a very reputable organization. You know, we look at them and go, oh, you are the professionals of the professionals. If anyone from KPMG is listening, feel free to post me a check. Sort of being slightly tongue in cheek, you know, we know that KPMG is this kind of professional services organization. And you can't just really rock up to a company like KPMG with no skills and say, hey, give me a job. I'm an out-of-work futurist. I used to be good. 
However, here's the rub. I've shown this to KPMG and the other guys based in the past. So imagine it's your first day on the job and KPMG is a consultant. And the KPMG bosses say, right, Matt, you know, we know it's your first day. We know that you have no skills in consulting whatsoever, but we want you to land, say, Pepsi as a client. And I go, oh my God, you know, how do I do any of this? Now, with platforms like ChatGPT, you can go into a platform like ChatGPT and say, acting as a KPMG consultant who has been asked to develop new business within PepsiCo, what list of questions should I ask the leadership team at Pepsi if I want to generate a report on the future of Pepsi's company strategy, leadership and growth? And ChatGPT will generate the questions and say, these are the questions that you should ask your contact at Pepsi to provide answers to so that you can generate a report on Pepsi's future leadership strategy and growth, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, it kind of does that. Now, when the guys at Pepsi actually answer these questions, you thump that back into ChatGPT and it spits out a KPMG advisory report in two minutes. Now, what we've actually seen with companies switching it a little bit to companies like BCG is when we've actually tag teamed human workers basically with these large language models, these AIs, BCG found that they were able to improve the skills and the productivity of their junior consultants by 43% in a few weeks, compared to about 20% for their senior consultants. When we have a look at being able to use these increasingly intelligent machines to teach us new skills, to act as our crutch, to help us problem solve, they're really very good. So now, basically, what we have is a, as a society is we traditionally say, if you have a college education, we're very sorry that your dreams are going to get crushed by AI, but we hope that you're successful in the future and uh, good luck. Increasingly, these tools actually help you upskill faster than ever before. I do a lot of work basically with American universities, and we've been able to show people that you can accelerate your learning and development or the learning and development within your organization or your own individual learning and development sixfold. So I can show you how you can learn new things, anything, whether it's how to be a data scientist, how to be an Ernst & Young tax advisor, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I can show you that we can help you learn new things six times faster. Now, what does that do to the paradigm of, okay, so you have a college education, we're sorry that AI is going to crush you. What happens basically when you're able to learn for yourself? What happens basically when you have the right attitude? What happens when you know what you want to do, which is really the crux? It's almost that Akagi, you know, the Japanese Akagi framework that we see. What happens when all of a sudden I put a tool in your hand that acts as a one-on-one -on -one tutor that can teach you anything? Now, all of a sudden, is the future dystopian or is the future yours to claim? And as you say that, one of the other things that's coming to mind is credible people like Jamie Dimon saying, we may have the opportunity to go to a three-day work week in the future. Now, people may still choose to compete like heck to be ahead of their colleagues and they may still work 60 hours a week. But there is the opportunity to deliver a similar amount of productivity that we do today with fewer hours. And as I say that, I also hearken back to being a young financial analyst when personal computers were coming online. And the reality is I worked more hours. I just generated a thousand scenarios rather than two with a pencil and a 10 key calculator. Well, absolutely. So, so taking sort of Jamie Demon's point, on the one hand, you know, we saw the same basically with Watson. So one of the founders of IBM, uh, where he said, you know, in the future, I think computers will let everyone work a four day week. And actually, we're working more. And now basically, everyone can get me on email and WhatsApp and all this sort of stuff. And actually, I'm working 48 hours a day. So you know, what happens to that vision? However, you know, there are two things here. So when we have a look at the role that artificial intelligence is currently playing on improving people's productivity, if you have a look, for example, at programmers, surveys basically are now showing us that AI is helping software developers become, say, 63% more productive, which means you can get more done. However, one of the other interesting things that we're seeing with AI, when it's actually used as a sort of teammate or a co-worker, I'm not going to say co-pilot because it sounds like I'm pushing Microsoft's product. I'm going to say co-worker. I'm going to trade 
trademark that one now. When we actually, yeah, when we have a look at using AI as a co-worker, on the one hand, we can use it to improve our own productivity. But we've also been able to show that it can help people's mental health. So we kind of come back to the boardroom again via an indirect route. Because what we've seen with software developers is when software developers have gotten stuck with, I've got this problem, I don't know how to solve it. Normally, they go and ask another human software developer and say, I've got this problem, can you help me? And that other person would say, yes, no. But now they can actually ask the AI. And they say, I'm trying to create a function that does X, Y, Z. I'm stuck. Can you help me? And the AI comes back saying, right, okay, if you're trying to create a function that does X, Y, Z, have you tried this? And because these AIs are increasingly good at what they do, you know, there are downsides, but because they are increasingly good at what they do, their capabilities are improving by multiples, they come back and say, look, if you're stuck, here's a solution. And suddenly people who are using these AIs as a co-worker are saying, actually, that's great. Not only have I learned how to solve that problem because I got the AI to explain its thinking, but now I've actually got rid of that roadblock. So on the one hand, yes, we are already seeing people become more productive. People who keep asking to write for my websites, I know that they're more productive because they can knock out articles in like two seconds now that are really general and horrible. So quit doing that, people. But then when we also have a look at the four-day week, Jamie Demon talks about a three-day week. In the UK, we ran a trial of a four-day week. And what we found was that you keep people's pay the same. They like that. You drop their hours from five days down to four days as a work week. But we found that productivity improved by 20 to 30%. But we also found that the work-life balance was better and that people were happier. And actually, when you have a look at the five-day work week, where did that come from anyway? The vast majority of organizations want to see that their employees are busy. As a CEO, if you're walking around your office and uh, people are chatting, then some CEOs will look at that and say, oh my God, what am I paying you for? But if those people are heads down, but actually they're surfing Facebook or doodling, the CEOs could still look at that and go, oh my God, they're all working. It's fantastic. When I was working at IBM and all these other companies, we called it the art of heuristics, the art of looking busy when actually you're not doing anything. And surveys, again, on human productivity in the workplace have shown that on average, we are productive for two hours a day. So thank you, boss, for the other six hours of pay while I was practicing, you know, looking busy. So when we actually have a look at these four day work weeks, where did five day work weeks actually come from anyway? So what we've been doing is we've been measuring how much time have you spent doing our work, as opposed to how productive have you actually been? If I give you a task, but you complete that task to my level of satisfaction within five minutes, you've completed the task. But in today's five-day work week world, I want to know, well, what are you doing with the rest of your time? And it's like, well, I'm doodling, not that you're seeing me doodle. So this concept of a five-day work week is hundreds of years old. It's a fake construct. I don't pay my own staff to look busy, but it's okay provided it's Monday to Friday that they look busy. I'm paying them to do something. And if they do that really quickly and it's to a great standard and the clients are happy and smiling going, Matt, you're awesome, then great. So this kind of brings us to this kind of question. When it comes to the workforce, are we actually measuring the right thing in the first place? And then I don't think we'll be working a three-day work week. I mean, Jamie Demon can work a three-day work week because he's the boss. That's it. Maybe he works Saturday and Sunday because no one emails him. And then he sort of comes into the office on Monday and then has an AI, you know, like we saw in Davos, you know, there are a lot of CEOs that first started using ChatGPT at Davos, that, you know, last year to actually automatically answer people's emails. You know, maybe heck, that's how he's actually getting away with it. Yeah, I'm still not there, but maybe that's why I'm working so many hours. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, if we got an artificial intelligence to read between the lines, maybe Jamie Demon's actually thinking of retiring. Did we just send JP Morgan's stock down by 30% <laughs> if you're a quantitative trader? On that note, what would you advise busy executives? What one or two things do you need to get right in the next year? I would suggest the first thing to do is unlearn what you already know. Because the future doesn't work the way that the past did. I have lots of examples of that. Secondly, take downtime. Now, a little story here is actually when you have a look at Mark Benehoff, he, a, little, a number of years ago, he was complaining vociferously. He was going on a two-week holiday to Bora Bora, and his wife hid all his phones and hid his laptop. And he was like, if I'm going on holiday, 
I've got to take my work phone and my work laptop and everything else because I just have to. Oh, my God. And she apparently, basically, according to him, she said, absolutely not. You're leaving them behind. So off he went to Bora Bora for a nice two-week holiday. And he then came back and actually handed over the reins of Salesforce to someone completely different because he went, you know what? Having those two weeks out without tech, without disturbance, kind of having that retreat actually let me really think about my own priorities as an individual, the priorities that I actually had for the company that I'd founded. And actually, I realized that they were really out of kilter. So I did something about it. So executives nowadays are so much basically in this moving from firefight to firefight that they actually lose sight of the big picture. So while it is incredibly difficult, I would actually suggest that CEOs and leaders actually hand over the reins of their operations to their juniors and go off and actually just get brain space. As we see basically with a lot of the world's greatest visionaries and inventors, they don't come up with the next great idea, basically, when they're in the middle of a firefight. They come up with the next great idea or purpose or vision or whatever you want to call it when all of a sudden they're walking the dog. You know, it's like, my God, that's been right in front of my nose all of this time. Why didn't I see that? So unlearn everything, which is easier said than done. Secondly, take time out. Go and explore different things. And by different things, I don't mean if you're a banking exec, go and have a look at what the competition are doing. Go and have a look at other sectors, other areas of interest. Go and have a look at other countries. Get out there. Explore. Get a different point of view. And then the third thing is be calm. In today's world, it is very, very easy to get caught up in these firefights. It's very easy to get caught up in the moment and actually react. Someone mentioned to me a little while ago, when something happens to you or to your organization, most of us react. And then we blame that reaction for whatever we did. We aren't reacting to situations. We are responding to situations. As leaders realize basically that reactions are knee-jerk, but recognize that responses are carefully considered. So don't react. Realize that you respond. And when you actually realize that you have control over the response, that's your air gap. That's your space to breathe. That's your opportunity to actually consider various outcomes or what it is that you really want to do. So those would be my top three. I've got loads, but, you know, (laughs) executives have got to go back to their firefights now. (laughs) What I didn't hear in there is get better with AI. No. So when we have a look at, for example, the technology agenda, there is this pressure, or most of the leaders I talk to feel this pressure to know everything about these new technologies. You don't need to know everything about these new technologies. You need to understand what they are and what they're good for and what they're not good for. So with a lot of the leaders that I work with, I kind of try to act as a PA, where it's the two-minute summary of artificial intelligence and why you might care about it. That's it. So I do a lot of work with royal households around the world as well. And one of the royal households that I work with basically is the Abu Dhabi royal family. Generally, what they want to understand is when I'm having a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg about this thing called the metaverse, I want to be able to say, ah, yes, the metaverse. I understand what it is. These are the things that I know about it. It's that two minute sort of, you know, you're caught in an elevator conversation. Leaders don't need to know everything about everything. They need to be surrounded by people who understand what's happening, but can then boil it down to that two minute. So that's what this means. I mean, when you have a look at the president of the United States, for example, do you really think, say, Joe Biden basically is sitting down with all these AI experts to understand the ins and outs? He's not. He's being provided a piece of paper and it's a quick summary. As a leader, that's all you really need to know. You need to know that across domains. And then in your own head, you need to have the cognitive capabilities to join all this stuff together. The other thing I'd sort of say is if you don't understand something, ask. Because a lot of the leaders that I work with, they feel slightly worried. Some even feel slightly afraid of asking questions because they don't want to be seen to be the person who doesn't know. I mean, can you imagine a leader, say a CEO of a Fortune 100 company saying, so what is AI? Why should I care? You've got this perception problem within a lot of boardrooms as well because they don't want to be judged. You know, they don't want people to go, my God, but you're the CEO of this giant global multinational and why are you asking what is AI 
and what can I use it for? You should just automatically know, isn't there a godlike creature that you could just plug into and download all this knowledge? And then we ask you, why AI in our business? So get over the fear of asking. In fact, we're constantly telling our children, at least hopefully we are, there is no such thing as a dumb question or a bad question. Leaders, especially in these uncertain times, should be asking question after question after question. It's like, well, if this happens, then what? So what? Why should I care? What is that really about? How does that affect this? And what do I do about that? What has someone else done about that? Ask intelligent questions. And if you can't ask intelligent questions, ask dumb ones and then just get people to sign an NDA that they're not going to tell the press that you asked a bunch of dumb questions. That takes us back to the leader's role is being the best human on the team. Hmm. I got AI to do the AI stuff. As the executive, I need to leverage what the machines can do and I need to be really good with my humans. Yeah. And again, this kind of comes back to culture. From a CEO's perspective, when we have a look at artificial intelligence, increasingly the CFOs, for example, will say, AI is great. We can use it to automate half of our staff. But by automating half our staff, our profits can go through the roof and our share price moves up by 0.1%. Woohoo! You can either use AI to automate a lot of staff, or you can use AI to augment a lot of your staff. While the vast majority of organizations have run proof of concepts and run scenarios of what if we automate half our staff, the vast majority of them haven't got anywhere near to asking what would happen to my top or bottom line or both if I used artificial intelligence to augment my staff. And then By using AI, my staff were twice as productive. When you reframe questions, when you beat off tradition, when you don't do the status quo of, I'm going to automate everyone with AI, when you go the other path, all of a sudden, you can end up with organizations where the potential to prosper in the future is staggering. For example, if you go to most CEOs now and say, what do you think your organization would look like today if we were able to upskill everybody by at least 50% in the organization? And what do you think would happen to your top line and bottom lines if we could actually increase people's productivity by 50%? not the traditional sort of 2 to 6% that we've seen globally for the past few decades. That's a question that has never, ever been on any boardroom agenda. What if? And it will be. So with that what if, (laughs) to our listeners, I'll be listening to this multiple times. I hope you will be. Absolutely. In fact, I'll get my AI to listen to it, create a transcript, and then actually produce a summary for me. And then I will get my AI to turn this into a strategy and a business case basically that I can go and take to the bank. (laughs) But no, I mean, thank you very much for the invitation as well. You know, it's been brilliant. But, you know, this is the thing, you know, when we have a look at the world, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. There's a huge amount of volatility. But that volatility breeds opportunity. Every threat to you is an opportunity. But it's only an opportunity if you really understand what it is. And then you've actually got the cognitive capability and the teams and the culture around you basically to go off and execute whatever your purpose, vision, mission is, et cetera, et cetera. For people who want to follow you and continue to learn from you, where do they go other than Davos, which some of them can't? Well, so I'm going to be at COP28. That's it. So if anyone's at COP28, I'm going to be solving all the world's United Nations SDGs. That's a fun little sideline there. But you can find me at 311institute.com. So all the socials are listed at the top and everything else. I've written 13, I say books, they're kind of guides to the future, which they're free to download because I like democratizing access to the future if I use my little jargon piece there. But then I'm on YouTube as well and so on and so forth. I'm everywhere, like AI. (laughs) Would you like a bit of irony here? So what you could do is you could actually use AI to create a transcript of this podcast. And then once you've got the transcript, you could actually put it into a platform like Synthesia and actually get a digital human to actually replay this podcast with a human face. We have a digital Maureen called FOMO. She has replaced all of my videos. So now we have a snarky FOMO and a real FOMO for executive stuff. (laughs) Interestingly, other than people who know me, I'll say intimately well, most people do not know the difference. 
maybe that's because it's great AI. <laughs> or maybe you need more friends. <laughs> <laughs> Better friends. Yeah. Well, my team edits brilliantly. So the raw versus the team is a different thing. Yeah, the art of magic. Yeah, and they are magicians. Thank you again. Thank you, Matt. This episode is brought to you by the Innovative Leadership Institute, working with companies that recognize the need to upskill their leaders and transform their organizations. We help executive teams prepare for accelerated uncertainty by creating the foresight needed to stay competitive and transforming organizations to become future ready. If you'd like to discuss how we can help prepare your organization for tomorrow, please visit InnovativeLeadership.com and click Contact Us.